Hi, my name is Sean McIntosh, and I'd like to welcome you to the Ask the Experts about Software Audits panel discussion today. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available for on-demand viewing. If you have any questions, please submit them via the chat console, and we will do our best to address them during the webinar. If time does not allow us to address the question, I will have the panelists best suited to your answer contact you directly to answer it. Software audits have become more and more common over the last few years, and the audit process is time-consuming and potentially costly for companies. It creates both fear and confusion for many people and companies. To cut through this, we've assembled a panel of industry experts to examine the issue of software audits from a variety of perspectives. You can see our panel on the screen today, and I'd like to take this opportunity to ask the panel to introduce themselves. The way we're going to do this, we're going to do it in the order that their pictures are on the screen, starting from left to right, beginning with Mike Austin. Mike, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. So I'm Mike Austin. I'm the VP of Delivery here at Method 180. Uh, we're an organization that assists organizations primarily in, in two areas. One is um, leveraging our licensing expertise to negotiate smarter contracts with Microsoft and drive costs out of things such as enterprise agreements, as well as we have a variety of offerings around um, audit or software asset management defense, or if you want to do a self-assessment to determine where you, you stand in terms of your Microsoft licensing or organization assist with that. Okay, great. Uh, Dean Williams. Hi there, my name is Dean Williams, and I'm the president of Block64. Uh, we are a software company. Uh, is a uh, cross-platform uh, agentless discovery solution. The other is an analytics engine. Uh, and really what we're in the business of doing is telling our customers what they have and what they need to know about it, uh, all in pursuit of m minimizing risk, uh, reducing unnecessary expenditures, and ideally saving time. Okay, great. And then uh, Michael Shaw. Thank you, Sean. Uh, this is Michael Shaw. I am the CEO and co-founder of the American Council of Sourcing and Procurement Executives. Uh, if you're not familiar with our organization, we're about a 4,500 member senior level procurement and supply chain uh, executive exchange group. Our focus is primarily on the future of procurement supply chain in terms of people, process, and technology as the key agent of change. We have a 15 member, 1,500 member sub organization that is focused strictly on uh, IT sourcing and vendor management. And if you're interested in how to join that group, you can certainly send me a, a message later on. Okay, thank you, Michael. And last but not least, uh, Ed Ramirez. Thank you, Sean. My name is Ed Ramirez. I am the Chief Strategy Officer and co-founder of SLC Corporation. We are an Oracle exclusive uh, consulting company in which we have been helping customers for the last 15 years to negotiate against Oracle, to defend against an Oracle audit, and to reduce Oracle costs across the board. Um, we have been involved in over 200 Oracle audits, uh, both internally when I was at Oracle, as well as externally as a company serving our clients. Okay, great. Thank you. I mean, the reason we brought all of you together is I think between the four of you, you kind of really encapsulate the problem we're facing today and that Michael brings a unique perspective in that he comes from the procurement side of things and represents that constituency. We have subject matter experts from a licensing perspective and then also Dean rounds out our panel by providing expertise around the various tools. So I'm really wondering, you know, you all bring a kind of a profoundly different perspective on software audits, but I'm really wondering what you're seeing in terms of trends, and I thought maybe I'd ask Michael Shaw to answer that first, kind of coming from the customer perspective. Yeah, uh, sure. Thanks, Sean. Uh, first of all, just to, as a general comment, the uh, audits are huge revenue-generating machines for the, for the suppliers these days. Uh, didn't start out that way, but that's that's the way that you know that's the reality of where we are. So one of the things that we're seeing is a lot more organizations investing in ITAM and SAM software, uh, and that's a good beginning. But it's it's frankly really not enough because there's so many vagaries associated with things like definition of use and uh, user definition, different types of licenses and so forth. And then this is all becoming even more compounded with the uh, the presence of, of cloud applications. So uh, companies really need to understand their existing contractual rights and what's changing with each new purchase or renewal. 
Yeah, and it's really been evolving, hasn't it? It, almost, it seems like it's almost evolving faster in terms of the change, wouldn't you say, Michael? Absolutely. Okay, folks, uh, Mike or Ed, what are you guys seeing from the Microsoft or Oracle perspective in these? It's, it's Mike here. I, I would say similar to what Michael's saying is it, it is a huge revenue generating opportunity. And in fact, you know, Microsoft is using it as their revenue growth slows kind of in their traditional business. You know, the desktop office, Windows OS licenses, they're definitely using it as a way to drive more and more revenue. Um, and, and, you know, a little bit different than from a tools perspective, I think that there's a skill set that's missing in the marketplace at a, at a lot of clients, which is a negotiation skill set that's required to handle these audits. Because, yes, there's the piece about, you know, determining what's deployed out there and what's licensed. But at, at some point in time, it becomes, uh, you know, all about a negotiation with them. I can give you an example. Um, you know, recently we had a client where there were a number of findings presented by uh, the auditor to Microsoft and, and you know, held to be true, but those findings were all assumptions. They, you know, the auditor did not go out and scan the network for a variety of things around server mobility and things like that. And Microsoft just accepted those as being true and said the client owed them all that money where, you know, their position was our servers don't move. And so, you know, assumptive based things within these audits can kill you. Uh, they can cost you a ton of money and time fighting them. So you need a good, strong negotiator that can stand up and, and push back on these vendors. Okay. That's, that's great. Um, Ed, do you agree with what Mike's saying? Is that similar to what you're seeing as well? Absolutely. So from an Oracle perspective, uh, over the last three years, we have seen a dramatic increase. And number one, the aggression of the audits from an Oracle perspective. And number two, the actual findings from an audit. Uh, back in the day when we were doing the audits, and it, it, would, it would not be uncommon to uncover anything from a $1 million to $5 million shortfall on any customer that but we decided to audit via an Oracle. And when we were defending clients, the same thing we would find, that Oracle would come up with something between $1 million to $5 million. That was the range. Now, with, uh, with virtualization technology, the Oracle findings are anywhere from $30 million to $250 million. Really? Not, it's not uncommon to have an audit report come back and say, you're out of compliance by $250 million because your VM environment is not licensed correctly. So I'm um, so it seems to me there's kind of two pieces here. There's both you know in terms of the entitlements, license entitlements a customer has, but then there's the other piece which is really what's actually deployed. And I mean I think Dean's probably our expert on what's actually deployed. Is, is this kind of mapping what they're saying is a lot of this solve, solvable by tools like what you have today, or is that just part of the equation? Well, I mean the the methods that are used for detecting software installation have by necessity become much more intricate and complex in the last 10 uh, or 15 years you know as we've moved away from traditional models of one license to one installation uh, into what seems to be an increasing focus on capacity based licensing which is of course in reaction to, to virtualization technology so it, the, the, in plain english it's harder these days to understand and decipher what you as a customer actually are consuming. And I wouldn't go so far as to say that vendors are preying on that, but it does create a somewhat lopsided situation uh, wherein the penalties for being wrong are as high as they've ever been. And it's much more difficult to be right without, um, uh, without the right tools at your disposal and sometimes even with the right tools at your disposal. Okay, well, and, and I, and Sean, if I, if I may, oh, go right ahead. I would just add to that in that it gets even more complex because the way things that are de are deployed and the way that an inventory tool uh, pulls a report may not align to how you're contractually told in your contracts you need to count, and so it becomes even more complex when you have to interpret employment or deployment data uh, from a tool that you know could could come from various different sources, be pulled in different ways. Um, you know, you've got a tool in place that may work for Microsoft that doesn't work for Oracle and how Oracle counts. And so trying to map that to your contract language becomes very complicated as well. And I think that's another area that these vendors are able to leverage is the ambiguity in, in what they say in their contracts in terms of how you, how you need to count 
uh, and how things are actually, you know, in real okay. reality deployed out there. Well, I'm just wondering. So, my, with go, going with what Dean, Michael, uh, Dean and Mike have said, Michael, I'm wondering: Do you see your constituency? Are they starting to create specialization of roles and bringing additional people and additional internal training to deal with this complexity? Yeah, but you know, I think it's uh, you know, as Mike said, I think it really takes uh, a different skill set that that you don't acquire simply by sourcing a. Uh, the category for a long time or even particular vendors because I think the biggest challenge here is is understanding your contracted rights and how that specific language matches up with the current language that the different suppliers are using and sometimes it can be very different the definitions change and so what you think you may have rights to you may in fact not and you may have rights to things that that the suppliers are inventing you you don't so it, it takes somebody that really understands kind of from the supplier's side as well as the uh, the buyer's side what rights are in place and, and what needs to be negotiated. Okay, no, that makes sense. I'm just curious, so when, when a vendor, Michael, approaches, you know, one, one of your constituents, typically with, you know, an audit or however they're, whatever they're calling it, are, are vend do you feel like you're, that they're typically prepared? Do you feel like there's varying levels or is there kind of a commonality in terms of how they approach that in terms of just the gut feel as to whether they're ready to, to respond? I think it's really all over the board. I mean, you, you've got you, one of the keys, I think, to being successful in an audit is, is, to, is to start early, be prepared, not only have the, the right understanding of your contractual rights, but... Uh, we always recommend using outside third-party resources because even the large organizations can't understand all the detail, contractual nuances uh, about every different uh, IT supplier that they have. So it, it always helps to bring in the resources that you need to, to augment your internal expertise. Okay, no, that's good. I'm just going to throw this out to the panel in general. So I know a lot of the major vendors either will audit a customer themselves or they may try to call it something else like a software asset management engagement. Some of them also use third parties. Are you seeing, what do you guys think of this and how, how do customers typically um, react to this sort of thing when they're being um, approached by a third party potentially or if it's not being called out as it's spelled out as an audit necessarily? I can certainly weigh on, in on that a, a little bit, Please. Sean. So you know, what we're seeing is, you know, customers are much more savvy uh, around um, supposed friend assessment from the audits. And, you know, they understand that it's really an exchange in kind for, you know, the information in return for, you know, less less of a penalty for, for an audit potentially or a free audit, et cetera. So, I mean, what we're seeing, quite frankly, are a lot of organizations on receipt of, of these types of notifications attempting to either conduct their own study or contracting a neutral intermediary to give them uh, an understanding of what they can expect to see when they actually invite uh, the wolves in, uh, you know, to the environment. Okay. And Sean, this is Ed. I, I would agree with what Dean is saying. Uh, we see that the customers, especially in the Oracle side, are becoming much more aware and responsive to that. Back in the day, you know, again, going back three to four years, it was not uncommon to have an Oracle sales rep show up and say, hey, I want you to fill out the server worksheet for me and get it back to me. And that was, that was the soft audit. And every customer would sit there and fill out the server worksheet, hand it back to the Oracle rep, and the Oracle rep would come back with some findings. Uh, because customers have become more aware, customers have been pushing back a lot more and saying, well, contractually, I, I really don't have to provide this information to you. Uh, you know, our systems are our systems, and it's internal information to us. You know, please tell us how we can we can help you another way, but we can't share that information with you. And um, and so they've been pushing back on that. So the formalized Oracle process is is much more prevalent now to where they just go and nominate a customer for an audit versus the way they used to do it before. Well, and, and these are big revenue generators for all of these software companies, Microsoft, Oracle, Adobe, you know, IBM, anybody that does vendor audits, they're, they're not doing it to, you know, they'll go in with some of these things, and I think, Sean, this is part of what you're alluding to, is they'll go in and say, okay, well, it's not an audit, it's a software asset management engagement Correct. or SAM engagement or whatever they want to call it. 
and therefore it's not an audit, it's a friendly thing. Well, the reality is what they do the moment they get in the door is exactly the same thing as if it was an audit. And so even though they may position it as, hey, we want to actually teach you some better you know, ITAM processes or asset management uh, processes as part of this, it's an audit. And I think clients, I think clients have caught on to that because you, you're only going to get bit by them once. Where it's okay, this is great, I can go in, and then you know you identify that, you know, some server admin clicked a box that turned on some feature, and now all of a sudden in this friendly engagement, you're telling me I owe you a million dollars for a feature that was enabled that we're not using. Hey, I thought this was friendly. Why can't we just shut it off? Uh, we, we weren't intending to to do that. And, you know, once we get into those discussions, you find out it becomes all about revenue, right? And so I think, you know, it doesn't matter which vendor pulls it. They've been bitten by somebody. Um, you know, some of our larger clients are, are going through four and five vendor audits a year, um, you know, across different software publishers. So um, they're, they're catching on to these, these games that the vendors are playing. Okay, so I'm, so I'm curious. So once a, an audit, a customer has been nominated for, let's just call it an audit or a SAM or whatever, is there a kind of a standard process that kind of walks through? Because on the surface, it seems like it'd be pretty simple. It'd be, here's your entitlements, and the vendor provides those, and then they run what's deployed. But I'm guessing the devil's in the details, isn't it? Oh, for sure. Oh, go ahead, Ed. Yeah, ab thanks, Mike. Absolutely, Sean. So, you know, the games begin, actually, with the notification on the Oracle side. So Oracle will notify the customer, hey, you know, we're, we're enforcing our right or invoking our right to audit your use of Oracle software. And you have three days to get back to us, or if we're going to be very generous, five days to get back to us with the needed information and our first meeting. Uh, and like you said, the devil in the details, what the customers don't understand is that you're contractually, you have 45-day notice. In 45 days, you could do a self-assessment and really look at your data and, and get together a very good game plan. Oracle, what they do is, again, eliminating the details, go right in and say you have three to five days to get us all the information that we're requesting, and, uh, and we begin meeting with you right away. And, again, if customers don't know the details of their contract, it causes them a, a huge problem because they're scrambling to get this information to Oracle because they think they're contractually mandated to do so. And we, we see that a lot. Um, it's kind of a timely subject because, you know, with it, it, oddly, um, sometimes these things seem to pop up uh, in alignment with fiscal year ends uh, of the, the auditing companies. And, you know, the, the quite often, depending on, you know, the rep, it's not certainly an organizational thing, but there may be a case where they're trying to trade in uncertainty and fear and, you know, receiving an audit letter is scary for anyone and can spring them into action. But, you know, I think it's an important thing to know that you always have options when you've received something like that and you are not compelled to act immediately. You have the time to gather the information you need, like Ed is saying. And one of, the, one of the things that I would say is, depending on where these things come through, a lot of the times they're going to be, I'll say, um, start it within IT. You know, an audit letter gets dropped to the CIO or somebody within their organization, typically. And so uh, what really happens, and, and Michael, I'm curious to get your thoughts on this, but uh, what really happens, I find, is a lot of the times the IT organizations are not built to deal with these things. And, and what I mean by that is they may have asset management people, um, you know, within the organization. They may be able to get inventory, uh, but they're not comfortable having difficult conversations and pushing back on, on their vendor or, or who they perceive to be their partner. And so, you know, if, if it stays within IT solely, um, it could become a problem where they may settle for, you know, a lot of a lot of money that they don't need to spend just because they don't want to rock the boat, so to speak. And you know, I think it's important that when these things happen, that these organizations build an appropriate team, which you know, maybe IT may may include procurement, may include fi uh, finance, and may include legal. And I, and I don't know, Michael, if you've got any you know best practices that you hear in organizations there, but I I do think that you know, if that all, all that expertise sits in IT, that's great, but I do think that these things need to be spread across the organization to ensure that the risk is a proper, properly mitigated. You know, I think you've, uh, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head there. Um, 
most organizations are a little bit flabbergasted. One, it doesn't matter whether you're dealing with Oracle or Microsoft or SAP or whoever, they all look at it as revenue generators. And uh, I, w I would say one common thread that they all have is that they typically will present you with a bill that's 5x or 10x what's really due. And, and the reality is they may not have any more clear an idea that you have of exactly what your license rights are, but they assume that if they hit you with a, a big bill of several million, you know, $10 million, that if, if they pare it down to five, you're going to feel good about it. And that, that's kind of a common strategy that a lot of the suppliers use. So shouldn't feel good about getting a $5 million bill when you may only you know, you may not own anything. You may own something much smaller than that. Well, it's, it's funny. I, I talk a lot about if you take that ten million dollar example you just used. I, I talk about there's really three buckets that 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 ten million kind of gets divided into. And you know, I kind of think that the first bucket's about fifty to sixty percent. So about that five million that you just mentioned, Michael, is just what I call wrong audit findings. There were assumptions uh, that the auditor didn't close off on when you go and find the data. Um, you can just prove those to be wrong. Now, sometimes it's difficult. Organizations, you know, have a hard time documenting uh, documenting these things sometimes. But you know, they're they're probably wrong audit findings, to be honest. Or you know, wrong might not be the right word, but just very conservative. An auditor is not going to make a call on a vendor behalf. They're just going to be very conservative in terms of what the data tells them. And then there's another place that's probably you know somewhere between 20 and 30 percent. And that's what I call the gray area uh, of an audit. And I'm going to come back to that in a second. And then there's another that leaves, what, about 20%, let's say, somewhere between 10 and 20%, which was probably your true up. That was probably the stuff that you deployed net new that you had to buy anyways. And so what, what happens is the vendor come in with that 10 million, and you get rid of the 5 million that was just wrong. And then you know the audit findings to go, say, from an auditor to the vendor's 5 million. And you still don't feel great about that you know, 2 to 3 million, that's that gray area. And you start negotiating with Microsoft or Oracle or whoever, and they say, hold on, we already got rid of half your findings, so we're not negotiating. You just owe us the stuff and they get stuck. But gray area is the toughest part because you want to try and make sure that nothing goes from the auditor, if it is a third-party auditor, to the vendor prior to getting rid of the, the, the stuff that was wrong, um, which seems obvious, but you'd be surprised how many times organizations just take it and let it go to the vendor. Uh, but the gray area is the vendor, the auditor themselves, not going to make a call on, and that's just stuff like you know in Microsoft. If I, I use them as an example, um, we're not licensing certain industry devices under our enterprise agreement because the EA allows for that, and so we pulled 2,000 desktops out and don't need Office and Windows licenses on it. And the auditor goes, well, we don't know because it's running a Windows OS, so maybe it should be a qualified device. So we're going to include them in there, and you need to buy Office and Windows licenses. And so they're not going to make a call on whether your machine fits the definition of industry device if it's kind of unclear whether it does or not. And so you really need to be able to document that stuff. But you know that's really the way I find these audit findings come down. If it's 10 million, 55 to 6 million of it is just wrong, you should be able to get that out. The harder parts of the 20 to 30 percent that's gray, and the other parts of stuff that you were willing to pay for anyways, because it's stuff that you legitimately owe for is you know natural growth. Okay, so once once an once an audit has been kind of launched and they're in, they need to get deployment data, and I'm guessing most vendors are under an obligation to provide that to them. Do most of them just take the data from whatever tool that the customer has, or do they insist on certain tools being used? I, I you know, I, I'll, I'll let Dean talk about this a little bit too, but I can give you a perspective from Microsoft. You know, each auditor that they use or SAM partner that they use has different tools. So there's no consistency. But the one thing that I find funny about this whole sort of process with them is yeah, SCCM is an inventory tool. And if you try to provide them inventory in an audit or a SAM engagement, well, SAM engagements are a little bit more likely to accept it. But in a true audit, they won't accept that data. Um, they want to run uh, their own third-party tools and scripts and things like that. And you should be very... Um, very careful about uh, accepting that stuff because there's nothing in your contract that states what tool is to be used. It's quiet on that. Um, so I don't know that necessarily if you really want to push them, do you have to use third-party tools? Probably not. Um, but you know, there's there's lots of reasons why you would want to use, I would say, an independent tool, and that's why you know we work in our business with with Block 64 quite a bit in these scenarios to get an 
independent view from you know some of these tools that may be a little bit more friendly to Microsoft. Ed, do you see similar stuff in Oracle, I would think, and then maybe we can let Dean talk a couple of seconds here. So I'll jump in. This is this is Ed Ramirez, and uh, here's what we see. And in, in as, as it was mentioned earlier, you know, the devil is in the details. So as Mike said, you know, Oracle is going to come to you and say, "Hey, you got to run all these scripts on your databases," and you know, these are all Oracle generated scripts. And they make it sound very benign. You know, they're just SQL scripts that take a couple seconds to run, and that's all you have to do. What they fail to mention is that in these scripts, within these scripts are an entirely new license set agreements. And so you have to, in order to use this, agree to all of these new licensing agreements that Oracle's introducing. And so, there, as Mike mentioned earlier as well, there's nothing in your contract that states that you must agree to additional random licensing agreements whenever you get audited. And so a pushback on that is extremely important because Okay, Oracle, you want to audit our use, and you want to install all this, you know, these, so these software packets into our systems. You're giving us no guarantee that our systems won't be damaged. You're giving us no guarantee, but yet you're protecting yourself on everything, uh, very much like the licensing agreement works. So you're going to audit our use, and you're going to get us to agree to additional licensing agreements. And so it becomes a real problem for those clients that, kind of uh, without any knowledge begin to run all the software throughout their enterprise and 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 then you get into the software that Oracle uses is a very primitive tool and it brings back false positives. So not only does it go out and scan your network and, and, and bring back the information that Oracle is going to take and put together to, to create a bill for you, it creates false positives. So now you've got to go back and fight Oracle on why this is not true, why partitioning is not being used why advanced compression is not being used, and, and start building that defense that we've talked about in the past. But again, going back into the details, uh, you must pay attention to those details because these details add up to millions and millions of dollars for your group. Oh, and I think, this is Dean speaking, I mean, I can speak from the tool perspective, and I, I think there's a bit of a theme to what both Mike and Ed said, which is, you, you know, push push back and I think there's a way to push back without simultaneously poking the bear and, and you know what we've seen in our travels is that um, like Mike said um, you know high-powered consultancies that get brought in by Microsoft to do audits will use their own tools but what we've also seen firsthand uh, is that they will inspect the methodology that we for example are using and find it to be uh, acceptable which is really um, a mirror of the, of the types of methodologies that, that would be employed on uh, audits. Um, and, and something that I think is, is not exactly talked about out in the open is the obscurity uh, factor that plays in to these situations wherein, uh, such as the scripts that Ed is, is mentioning, when Oracle says you are being audited, please run these scripts, uh, the outputs are put plainly not human readable. Uh, and without the help of, say, someone like Ed and SLC, uh, you as a customer aren't going to know what you are handing off to Oracle until they come back and tell you uh, or provide you with an itemized bill, you know, quite frankly. So the, 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 the common factor in these sort of situations is uh, it's less about the, the tool that you're using to collect and more about are you... Uh, part of that process, are you aware of the disclosure that's going on? Not just what you're agreeing to, as Ed highlighted, but what you're actually disclosing uh, when you're inviting someone in to run uh, and take the outputs uh, of these tools without a lot of the time you getting a human readable version of that information. And, and the other thing that I would, I would kind of add to that, Dean, as well, is just sometimes these tools don't collect everything. You know, so I can give an example in the Microsoft world. A lot of the times, these scripts that are being used do not collect information around uh, vMotion and um, the stuff that's going on in the VMware world. And so you'll have a, uh, a client that, you know, Microsoft will claim server mobility is happening, but they haven't actually scanned to determine if a VM is moving from host one to host two, which would determine whether you need software assurance or not. 
And so if the scripts don't collect all the information, how are you supposed to get an accurate licensing picture? Yet they claim these things to be ac um, uh, accurate and that their findings are, you know, their findings and they are, are what they are. Okay, well, I guess I, I liked what Dean was talking about, about the, about the obscurity, uh, uh, obscurity factor. And what I'm wanted to say is there's a lot of th moving parts as well. Things like bring your own devices, and then we've got other things that are, I would say, client access licenses, for instance. Those are almost like vapor. How do you, how do you account for those, and how do you keep track of things like that? I, I certainly um, would love to talk on that because that's been a, a sort of personal mission of mine for a, a couple of years, and it, that problem has become compounded by um, the hybrid of on-premise and off-premise or cloud technologies. So, I mean, you have your traditionally installed products. We've now added um, capacity-based uh, products. We've added things that are really just legal entitlements for connectivity, things like client access licenses or client management licenses. And then there's uh, cloud services that aren't really installed anywhere. So how does one go about having that all coalesce into a, a, a sort of, you know, co coherent portrait of, of the environment. And uh, most traditional systems management tools, even ironically Microsoft's own uh, system center platform, aren't always uh, gathering information such as client access license information because that's not really what they're engineered to, to do. Uh, so it's really important that that information be available because it's a huge hidden cost driver, um, particularly as, as Sean mentioned, when mobile devices are being added into the equation, you need to license those if you're in a per device um, exchange model, for example. So having that information, number one, at your disposal via the that is being it is really important, but tools uh, exist by the, the, the dozen. It's m much more important to have that in a format that is is something that you can digest and make a business decision based on. Okay. Mike, do you guys have any thoughts on the whole BYOD or CALs, things like that that aren't really physically installed per se? Well, that's that's just it. How do you actually track that stuff? Exactly. Right? And and what ends up happening in these audits are, oh, you can't track it, therefore we assume 100% of your users are using it, therefore you need to license it across the board, right? So this that's, is a gray area you were referring to. It definitely falls into that gray area, right? So how do you prove, you know, an example, we had a, had a client recently that was licensing a device Cal model uh, where some functionality was turned on where users potentially could have gone home and use, use the servers. And so they basically came back with audit findings and said, you need to rebuy all your CALs to use your CALs because this functionality is turned on. And, you know, the, the position of the client was in our business that doesn't happen. And if it does, it's a very small, small percent. And the only way that the auditor could prove their point would be to actually audit the number of devices that were accessing from outside the, you know, kind of corporate-owned PCs and, and laptops and stuff like that. Um, I don't know any way that that can be done. I haven't come across one or at least, you know, come across one where it's easily done today. There are some tools that, that allow for that, but, you know, these are the gray areas. So you really need to make sure that, you know, you have policies and things like that okay. in place to, to discuss these things. I don't know, Dean, if you've got any thoughts on that, but I, I know this is an area that is becoming bigger and bigger, particularly as BDI gains more and more traction, right? Yeah, I mean, we, we are encountering this in just about every engagement that, that we do nowadays. And one, there, there are some gaps, actual technological gaps. For example, Microsoft themselves has no way to monitor SQL standard access, uh, you know, throughout the, the, the deployment of it in, in anything earlier than, than current versions at any rate. And, you know, the, the honor system or depending on your, your level of cynicism, the, the Wild West kind of comes into play there. But the reality is for client access licenses, uh, there's a, a prevailing wisdom that says it's cheaper and safer to just get it wrong and overbuy. And that is a big mistake because you can accurately track not just the number of client access licenses you're consuming, but what features people are leveraging. And that's a great way to soften the blow of any other uh, unavoidable audit costs that you might have encountered. 
No, I think that that's great. I guess one uh, kind of in the same area, kind of talking about kind of the gray zone. I guess the other one would be. I'm just thinking of this right now. Would be things like you get an organization and they've got whether it's OEM copies of something they purchased something and the software was bundled with it or it was part of a solution and. Oracle or Microsoft technology or something else was part of that. But there's no real official license per se. How do you account for that in audit? Do they go after that? They do because they're going to count. So, you know, take SQL is a great example of just that. A lot of uh, ISV applications themselves will include SQL licenses. You know, depending on the industry you're in, there's, there's more and more vendors that do, that do that. For instance, healthcare has a lot of vendors that provide complete solutions that include SQL. Um, even things like SAP, your SAP environment, if it's on SQL, it's potential that you, there's a good potential that you bought those licenses through SAP. But when Microsoft comes in and audits, they just see an S, a SQL database and they don't see that, you know, it was bought through SAP and then they, they claim that you need to buy a license from them, which would in essence be double licensing. Yeah. So the, the, the challenge in tracking some of that is that the, the, there's no, there's no good mechanism to do it. You have to actually be able to go back and say, you know, pull out your SAP contract and point out to Microsoft, we bought our licenses through SAP, take those servers off of your findings, right? Which can be very difficult to do, particularly if you don't have any processes around keeping track of, of those sorts of records. Now, I do know, and, and Dean, I'll let you talk on this, um, but I do know that, you know, sometimes there are things like if it was purchased through OEM and installed through OEM, there's a, a PID, an identifier inside of the uh, software itself that you could look at, and that would be an indicator. And I, I believe Block 64 can track some of that, but Dean, maybe you can speak to that. But ISVs, where they're providing the licenses, that's, that's very difficult to track. And in a lot of cases, people are double buying that stuff. That's true, and you know this. There, there's a bit of the pushback element here. I mean, we've seen you know vendors say we're not accepting that, and we've had to sort of say actually, you know, looking at the 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 channel ID of this installation, we can actually tell that this was a bundled installation. Like we, there are situ situations where we've had to kind of go into an advocacy mode um, and present these findings in pursuit of that. A lot of um, uh, tools that are designed to do a lot of things quite often aren't getting into that degree of detail and um, you know we're hyper focused on really you know equipping customers with the the raw um, tools to actually withstand these types of audits but um, you know we're certainly not the only ones that, that can do that but I think the important message is um, the first result the first answer isn't always the final uh, answer and there are myriad ways OEM licensing, a better tracking of client access licenses or remote users. There are myriad ways to chip away at that first result and first finding to, to, to create a much more favorable outcome for you. Um, and what we see uh, is unfortunate uh, is a lot of customers getting caught in the glare of um, receiving a letter and going with their first findings. And sure, you're not going to get audited again for maybe a, a little while. But the reality is that there hasn't been a deep dive on what was actually found. Um, there may be opportunities that were overlooked, just like the ones Mike is describing. Okay, and I'm just going to mention right now, we're starting to get some questions that are coming in via the chat console. I do see them. We will get to those shortly. So if you, anyone who's listening has some questions, feel free to submit, and we will get to those. We just got a few more, a little bit more ground to cover, and we'll get to those. I guess a question I have for Michael. Michael, we're seeing, you know, at least in terms of when I'm talking to organizations, almost everybody's looking at cloud in terms of moving some of their infrastructure to a cloud-based. Is that what you're seeing from sourcing a procurement? And do they see, tend to have concerns around compliance, or do they kind of see that as a solution to compliance? No, I think it's a concern because, I mean, the whole game changes significantly when you get into cloud with with regard to the, the way the software is licensed and interpreting the licenses and so forth, as you know, many of the examples that Ed and, and Mike and Dean have, have discussed there. And I think what it what it's done is it's created even more of a gray area, I think was Mike's Mike's term there. And one thing that you can be assured of is that when it comes to gray areas and interpretations of things like license rights is that the suppliers are always going to take the most liberal interpretation that, that favors them of, of whatever those rights uh, uh, are that, that, would, that would benefit the, uh, the suppliers themselves. So, so that's, a, that's a, it's a big challenge. Uh, 
in general and just with all the different suppliers and all the changing technologies and everything moving to the cloud, it's it's compounded that much more and is much more difficult to keep up with than ever. Yeah, and I, I would just say that the the risk, you know, I think some vendors are claiming that it's going to be easier to, to license, right? Because you're not tracking some of these things. It's just, you know, based on consumption or whatever. Pay for what you use. Yeah, whatever metric you're doing. I think the risk becomes oversubscribing, right? Paying for more than you're using, right? Or, it, you know, in Microsoft's case, um, I, I can't remember who it was recently, one of the, the big... Uh, IT magazines wrote an article on Office 365 and how it was confusing. And you know, as I was reading it, my thought process really was, it's really not confusing. Um, the problem is the way that they've done the bundling is forcing people not to have the choice to purchase what they need. So, you know, if I'm being forced to take an Office 365 e plan because I want to use OneDrive, and uh, Microsoft's making that the most cost-effective way to buy it. It'd be much better if they just offered the individual prices that they, you know, that, that they could offer the individual products, but they want to bundle it up for obvious reasons. So the risk becomes oversubscribing, in my opinion. You know, compliance probably will still be there, but I think it's just oversubscribing that's going to become the trend of the, you know, the future, so to speak, five years from now. Yeah, and th that's certainly something we're seeing is a lot of people kicking the tires on Office 365, buying a bunch of it, not deploying any of it. But what we also see at the same time, it, uh, tons of our customers, I would say 100% of our customers have some SQL 2005, an 11-year-old product, and half of them have SQL 2000 still, the 16-year-old product. The reality is nobody's, very few people are going all cloud right now. What they're doing is, doing a bit of both. And hybrid. That, yeah, a hybrid model, and some of it is rooted in the past. Some of it has an eye for the future. That creates, uh, that creates an additional complexity because you're managing future models, present models, and past models all in one. Of course, vendors love a cloud-based model because it guarantees them predictable recurring revenue. It reduces uh, accidental or intentional non-compliance by having a subscription mechanism. But the reality on the ground, as you guys all on the phone, I'm sure, are experiencing, is you're not all the way in, in either world at this point, and you have to manage really two sets of terms, two sets of data. Well, there's lots of there's lots of cases, and I know this isn't what this call's about, but I'll just put this out there. So there's lots of cases where uh, a cloud solution is not cheaper than your current on-prem solution. Right, um, and so I think a lot of the times what ends up happening is these these uh, folks in IT are you know tasked with going to find the business case to move to the cloud are just pushing cloud because you know somebody told the CIO or the CFO or the CEO that it's it's cheaper and it's not, and so it's very difficult because you have to look at all of those things, right? And you have to look at those past licenses, the current licenses, your current investment in hardware and infrastructure to support it. And, you know, if you just bought a bunch of servers that still have three years on your books from a capitalization perspective, uh, moving those to the cloud doesn't take that three years of capitalization off your books, right? So um, it's it, there's a lot that goes into these decisions. Yeah, and, and to add a little bit more color into that, uh, something that came up recently in regards to a very dark and ugly side of cloud that might be happening in regards to audits. Uh, we had a situation with a customer where you, Oracle audited them. The findings were $30 million. It got very ugly. Uh, the customer pushed back on the $30 million. Oracle pushed back on that. And it became a very uh, difficult situation. Legal got involved. What the customer realized is that if they had been a cloud and most of their infrastructure was based on cloud, Oracle, during those uh, tough negotiations, had the ability to shut them down. Uh, but because they were on premise, Oracle had to negotiate in good faith with them. And so a very dangerous part oh. of this cloud oh. situation is that you're relinquishing 100% control to Oracle, in essence giving them the keys um, to be able to shut it on and off for you. Uh, and, thank, and thank goodness this customer was 100% on premise and Oracle had to negotiate this because they couldn't just shut them down. And basically, the audit findings came down from $30 million to 150000 which was, fell into the bucket that, my, that Mike was talking about, which was something they knew they had to true up with anyways. It was slated to be purchased. It was $150,000 from $30 million. 
So that's something that hasn't yet lured its, its head completely, uh-huh. but it's out there. It's a huge concern. Okay. But I, I, I'll just add, I'll let, just add this to it, and then maybe, Sean, we might want to jump to some of uh, the questions that are coming in. Absolutely. That, uh, you know, at, at some point, this becomes a negotiation. And that's, you know, kind of, I think, what Ed's illustrating, what his example there is illustrating, is this becomes a, a negotiation. And I think, you know, one of the things that we see quite often is organizations get into these audits or SAM engagements with, you know, Microsoft, the big, big vendor, and they don't want to stand up to them or they're afraid to stand up to them because what, what's Microsoft going to do? And I think, you know, you, you need to be firm with them. You need to be tough with them. You need to stand up with them, to them right? Uh, our, our one client that I've been kind of referring to had to basically say to them, you put audit findings in front of us that are all based on assumptions. Here's our assumptions. They land here. We're willing to give you a settlement based on our assumptions, not on yours. And if you want to use your assumptions, you need to prove them and you need to give us more, you know, tell us how to go get the data to prove that you're right. Otherwise, this is all that we're willing to do. And you got to be able to stand up to them and, and push back. Right? Don't, don't let them bully you. Okay, that's good. And I'm going to jump right into some questions now that we're getting from the audience. If anyone has any questions, uh, now is the time to submit them. We'll do our best to get to them before we wrap up. So I guess the first question I have, I think this is probably a Dean Williams question, but by all means, anyone else, feel free to chime in, which is any comments on if, how, when ISO 19770 standard and minus 2 and minus 3 will be relevant in an audit situation? Oh, that's a great question, and I, I think it really, um, for those who aren't familiar, um, th- those ISO standards um, pretty much uh, pertain to creating unique IDs or, or software ID tags for um, software so that there's a uh, rigid standard regardless if someone repackages or renames something or even we have to account for the variances in namings and, la- and, and multi-language settings, this ID number essentially tells you right away the specifics of a, a software title. The problem is it's only available one large event, number two, through their current products. So I, I would anticipate that we're looking at, you know, at a minimum five to ten years before those can really be relied on. And not because there's anything wrong with the standard but because of the glacial pace of change within the average um, North American enterprise. It, 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 is, uh, it takes a very long time for everyone to get onto a current um, platform, and you see that evidenced by the fact that there's still Windows XP uh, out there. And uh, you know, the, the reality is that it will be years and years before everyone is on uh, a current enough installation platform to even have SWID tags uh, for their software. Um, but you know, when that does occur, I think you'll start to see at least the big vendors being able to leverage them. But uh, it's, certainly, it's certainly a ways off yet. Okay, thank you, Dean. Um, the next question I think a few people could probably answer, which is, are there any questions on the accuracy of publishers' license data? Sometimes the customer's data may be more accurate. So I think what the question is relating to, yeah. I think, license entitlements in this case. Yeah, I can start, and then maybe somebody else can have a comment. So Microsoft will publish these things to clients called Microsoft License Statements, or MLSs, which are supposed to be a, rec- um, a report. It's, it's fairly complicated. It's got a number of tabs in an Excel spreadsheet, things like that. But it should be a report of all licenses that Microsoft has on record for that client. Now, they do go out and do research on affiliates and things like that and try and do their best job globally. But obviously, the bigger you are and the more complex your organization is, um, the more challenges there could be in there. We do see lots of licenses missing in those. Um, so they're definitely something that needs to be validated. There's certain license types that don't get reporting in them, reported in those. Some of those ISV licenses we were referring to earlier, OEM licenses, and then there are errors in the macros in those worksheets themselves. We had one client where uh, basically if you went back and tracked the transaction records on their enterprise SQL core licenses, I think there was something like 25 core licenses that were missing, which you know is a substantial dollar amount, right? So you, you, you do have to be careful with, uh, with the MLS. It, it, it does a decent job. There are problems, 
Um, you need, need to make sure that all your affiliates are accounted for. Know that certain license types definitely aren't going to be in there. Um, especially things like license grants. License grants will not show up in there. So if Microsoft offered you free OCS, uh, or sorry, Link Plus Cal's as part of uh, having an OCS Enterprise Cal covered under SA at the time, those don't show up. So if you didn't renew the SA, they're not included in there. So there's lots of exceptions to these things that need to be thought through. Okay. Uh, Dean, Ed, do you, anyone else want to chime in on that one or am I good to move forward? I think we're going to move forward then. So next question is, um, how do you account for software assurance? How, how SA is being assigned? Does Microsoft have a way to validate SA? So the only way that they have to validate SA is that it's active, right? So it's like under an agreement that's still active. So, you know, I get asked this quite a question all the time. It's like, how does Microsoft know or how do I actually assign a license to a physical asset, right? And I think, I think that's kind of where this question is, is kind I think of going. So. And, you know, I used to kind of joke a little bit and say, no, you just go in the server room and say, point at a server and say, I assign it to you, right? There's no, there's no track back. There's no trace. There's nothing that, that goes, uh, that goes to it to say this, uh, I don't know, SQL server with SA is assigned to SQL server 01, right? It, there's nothing that that happens. In fact, audits or inventory or even if you do a snapshot yourself, it's just a point in time because that usually estates today are ever changing. Um, so there is no kind of tie back um, to that. In fact, we would recommend that you kind of reset your licenses a couple of times a year anyways to re-optimize them out based on whatever changes have happened. But there's no way that they have to track it. They would just look and say, uh, this SQL server needs SA because server mobility or whatever right that they, they, they say it needs to have SA, and they would just make sure you have enough licenses with SA to cover the total number that you needed, so to speak. Okay, great. Yeah, to, to build on what Mike's saying, there, there's no binary level difference between a piece of software that has SA or doesn't have SA. That's the, the kind of the bottom line. Um, it's the same software that, that's installed, and therein um, lies the challenge that a license is a, a logical abstraction from software. You know, it's related to, but is not the same as the software. Okay, great. Um, next question is, how accurate would you say are the Microsoft SAM audit teams and their findings compared to real usage by the customer? <laughs> very. Uh, not very. Let's, uh, let's put it that way. That, that example where I was using the 10 million and the 5 is wrong and 2 or 3 is gray applies to SAM as well. I mean, some of them are good at it. Don't get me wrong. Not all of them are are, uh, you know, make these sorts of mistakes or whatnot. But I, I think that the problem with the process is that if they're, they're there to do them fast. These guys are turning tens or hundreds of these per, per rep or whatnot, and they're just doing them fast, and they're not doing a proper job, right? So we can't get this data. Okay, well, Mr. Customer, you can't give me that data, therefore I make this assumption. Well, in, in my opinion, the proper job would be, okay, here, let us help you find that data, but they don't want to do those things. So when you do that, there's always going to be errors. So um, I always tell people that, you know, the findings, you should be able to loop them in half at least, if not more. Um, but, you know, you need to be able to build your defenses and push back on these guys. Okay. I've, next question. I, I think Dean might be interested in this and might have an answer. Is, is there a SAM software solution you would recommend, or is there a difference between them? I'll oh. take it first. I recommend Block 64. <laughs> <laughs> is there one that I would recommend? Well, I mean, I, I think you probably can predict what my answer would be, but um, I, you know, I, I think there are other players out there um, as well, but I think it's more important to say that SAM is a, a capability and a function. It's not a, it's not a piece of software. And I think that is um, an attitude that has pervaded particularly the SAM tool manufacturers, um, the attitude of we are the panacea and all you need to do is deploy our tool. But in reality, uh, the right tool operated by the right people in accordance with the right process and, and rhythm of review are where software asset management happens. Um, there are tools that are better than others at gathering the right data, and there are tools that are better than others at presenting that in a digestible way. We have sunk significant effort into being um, world class in that space. Whether you feel we are, I'd love to, to find out. Um, but you know, there, we're, we're certainly not the only game in town. 
the yeah, product that, goes. What I would say is there's lots of players in this this space, and I think that one of the uh, one of the key things is making sure you understand how you need to count, and does my tool count that way, and how does my licensing work, and does the tool allow me to keep track of my licenses that way, and where it doesn't, you need to figure out how do I fill that gap, right? Because all these tools are going to do different things, and they're built from different different avenues. Some are built around the Microsoft methodology, some are built around Oracle, some are built around IBM. And so if you're using a tool that's built around Microsoft, it may work in an Oracle environment, but it's definitely going to have gaps in place. Okay. And I also encourage uh, the person who asked that question, if they want to reach out to Dean directly to have a more in-depth conversation, please feel free. So next question I have is, besides Microsoft and Oracle, what are some other vendors that are being aggressive with auditing right now? And I have a couple that come to mind personally, which is we're certainly seeing a lot more of Adobe, and I think IBM is becoming aggressive as well. Are you folks through your travel seeing other vendors that are getting particularly aggressive? Maybe, Michael, are you hearing anything from your group? Well, yeah, I would mean I'd throw SAP into that, uh, SAP slash uh, Ariba. I think most of the large suppliers have realized that that's uh, a very important revenue source for them, and they've all gotten more aggressive, so I wouldn't leave anybody out. Yeah, AutoCAD's another big one that I hear quite a bit. Okay, I think probably it's probably fair to say if you've got a sub substantial implementation of it and it's a big part of your IT spend, you're probably on the on the on their radar. Would that be an accurate statement? I would think so. Yeah. Okay. So this one I think is probably a mic question, which is what is the dollar impact on the processor to core transition with Windows Server 2016? So it really depends. It's only you're going to see price increases on servers that have greater than eight cores. Um, per processor, that's where you're going to see them. Our our numbers, if you look at over um, from 2012 to 2016, it, it's less than 10 percent in the average client. And we, we use a pretty sizable um, uh, sample size to kind of determine that based on a bunch of the the work that we've done um, in terms of uh, inventory. But what I would say is that the impact since the change in 2012 to processor and then to cores is much more significant, up, upwards of 40% over the last, uh, what's that, six, four or five years. Um, and I think that the, the challenge a lot of organizations face is that, uh, unlike SQL, Windows didn't do a great job of m doing the migration from server to processor licensing. Um, so a lot of people you know, didn't get double the server pro to processor licenses when they had a four core box and I think that's where the impact's going to come potentially more as Microsoft kind of narrows in on are you doing cores properly um, where you now had to have processor licenses that maybe you didn't get the right grants for. So I would say from 2012 to 2016 it's about 40 percent or sorry about 10 percent but from 2008 R2 to 2016 you could be looking at 40 percent. Okay. Well, uh, that that wraps up the questions, but I have one more question I kind of want to get you your thoughts on, which is I'm sure someone listening right now is in the middle of an audit right now. If you each could give one piece of practical advice for them, what would it be? Well, I can start. Mine would be to know your data. Um, make sure that you understand it. Make sure you understand how to tell the stories about what the data actually says. Do not accept assumptions and stand firm and, and pat on, on what you believe to be true. And this is Dean. I, I would say, um, you know, having uh, an inquisitive uh, and rational distrust of the, the data that you're being presented is a very healthy way to approach this. Um, there are ways to to be thorough without being antagonistic, but you know, more perhaps even more practically, make sure uh, that you always have the data you need on hand to withstand an audit because that removes so much of the implied urgency and panic in an audit. To, to have that data already ready to go when someone comes knocking, you're already, you, you've got them on their back foot and you're a step ahead, and it's just a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Michael? Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, in the middle of an audit, first I would just say as far as general advice is start preparing early. Uh, know what the audit schedules are typically for your major suppliers. You assume one probably every three years or so if you haven't bumped up your license commitment. Use a SAM tool and uh, don't rely on the supplier's uh, SAM tool. And definitely 
use a, uh, a third party vendor specific subject matter expert. And Ed? Yeah, and I would echo exactly what Mike just said. Be prepared. Uh, the more you prepare yourself is uh, very, very important. Know the details of your contract. Uh, you've got to know the details because there's a lot of protections in your contract that these vendors have either overlooked or the contract is silent on. And uh, the more you know your contract, the better you can defend yourself against uh, the audit findings. And lastly, uh, be aware that you are not going to be treated fairly. This is an unfair practice. It's an unfair game. So be prepared for that. Don't go into it with uh, the notion that it's all going to be fair and straight up. And if they say $30 million, it is $30 million. They must be right. Yeah. And, and Sean, I know we're, yeah. we're, we're over on time, but I'm just going to make an offer. I'd like you to send, oh, out, actually, go uh, ahead. send out my ebook uh, that I wrote on audits to anybody that attended the call today. Sure. I'll be, I'll be sending, um, after this conclusion of this, probably the next 24 to 48 hours, everybody will receive a link to this, which is being recorded, and also send a link to the ebook as well. But I think we're just about wrapped, but I just want to say this was great, guys. And before we completely close out, I just wonder if, you had, if each of you had some closing thoughts, if we can let people know where they can find you if they want to have a more de in depth conversation with each of you. Yeah, it's out on the screen, but Mike at method180.com. Yeah, my, my contact info is up there, but uh, yep. if you want to just talk uh, specifics, if you need help, or if you're interested in learning more about what we do, please uh, reach out uh, by any of these methods. And Michael Shaw. Yeah, so uh, my phone number is 830-385-6116. Or my email address is mshaw at the sourcing source, all one word, no spaces, dot com. Excellent. And, and, for, and for me, it would be uh, if anybody wants to discuss this further, uh, audits are a very, very sensitive situation and a very hot subject. Uh, we'd be more than happy to talk to you and uh, have a what we call a free consultation and discuss some of your situations and give you a fair evaluation. This was great. Uh, once again, I'd really like to thank our panel for joining us. I'd like to thank everybody in the audience for taking some time away from their morning or their afternoon, depending where they are, for joining us today. Um, this event, as I mentioned before, was recorded, and we'll be sending out links to the recordings the next couple of days, as well as a link to Mike's ebook on audit defense. But thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, Sean. Have a great Thank day, you. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.